let's start. The recording has started. So, well, welcome everybody to today's webinar, right? Today is a very special webinar and we had, you know, very big interest, right, from everybody uh, to join this webinar. We already have uh, 42 students in the classroom, in the space, in this, you know, <laughs> uh, team space, and well, the number is growing. And well, I would like to introduce you to uh, Simon, Samuel Constain, right? I don't know if I'm pronouncing well your last name. I'll say that, that's fine. <laughs> All right, okay. So Simon is a manager, yes, a general manager of Global Student Recruitment Agency, yes. And um, he is here today, right, to give us uh, a very interesting presentation that I'm sure you're going to to love because the topic is very, you know, useful for everybody, and I'm sure you you're going to to find it very, uh, you know, uh, fruitful. So um, he's going to uh, to speak about how to secure a professional job abroad, and he's going to give a guide to use in LinkedIn for non-native English speakers looking to work abroad. OK, so Simon, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for being here. I also thank want you. To thank, I also want to thank the, the Australian Embassy who helped me organize this uh, um, webinar. So it would be a pleasure to listen to you, please, students. Remember that you can ask questions um, at at the end, we're going to, to let uh, Simon speak um, and give his presentation. And at the end, you can ask questions and well, and, and maybe uh, interact with him. Thank you, Simon. Wonderful. The focus is yours. Thank you very much. Hi, everybody. Um, I'll try and speak slow and clear. I, I understand most people speak English quite well, but if you don't understand something that I say, feel free to ask questions and we can clarify um, afterwards. Um, I myself have uh, hired over a thousand people uh, for jobs, um, and uh, every day I look at, re at resumes, CVs, and I see a lot of mistakes and challenges for international students in Australia. So I've started giving um, job advice and prof professional um, job advice for internationals in Australia, helping them to move from casual work to a more professional work. It's been quite successful. Uh, we've had great feedback of people moving into professional fields. So I'd like to actually share that with you today. So when you uh, do think about traveling abroad, whether it be Australia, US, Canada, wherever it's going to be, you can take these principles into practice and uh, give yourself a head start above other people. So a um, little bit about um, Go Study, which is the company that I represent. We provide free advice and support for people looking to live, work and study in Australia. Uh, we've helped over 30,000 students um, study for university, study English, study for their professional careers. We help you out with your student visa. We give you free support during your studies and we provide social events in Australia to make sure you have the best time possible. So if you're interested in studying in Australia, then just go to gostudy.com.au uh, and you can learn everything you need to. We also have a website in Spanish as well. But let's get on to the topic at hand. Um, if you are interested in working in Australia, you have three basic options to start with. Number one, the most common option is people will undertake a student visa where they'll study at a college over here, and that will allow you to work 20 hours per week during your, um, during your course time, and you can work unlimited hours during your holiday time. Uh, other students choose to come over, uh, not students, sorry, if you don't want to study, you can come over here on a working holiday visa. That's valid for one year and it will give you unlimited work rights um, uh, in terms of the number of hours you can work, but you can only stay with your first employer for six months. And um, if you would like to stay longer in Australia, you need to do three months of farm work, um, then you can get a second visa. So it comes with some restrictions, but many Argentinians come out here um, on a working holiday visa. If you have a company that will sponsor you in a professional role uh, and you find a company that wants to hire you to be a manager or a graphic designer or something like that, uh, you can ask for sponsorship and they can give you full time work rights for two to four years. And that will then often lead to permanent residency. Um, it will be challenging to obtain sponsorship from Argentina unless you are highly skilled. So most people will come over here on a student visa on a, or on a working holiday visa. Uh, find a company, prove their skills, and then seek sponsorship afterwards. So 
There are three main kinds of jobs that internationals will take on in Australia. Um, casual jobs, permanent jobs, and freelance or contractor jobs. A casual job is the most common. Um, it's the typical jobs you can think of doing, working in a, a bar, working in a shop or retail, uh, cleaning, housekeeping, and construction. It's generally the first type of job that internationals will take on. Um, you're generally paid by the hour, um, but there are some ch uh, challenges there. You don't have sick leave, you don't have holiday pay, um, you can be terminated at any kind, uh, sorry, at any point in time. So the, the real goal of anyone international is to move from a casual job to a permanent job. And a permanent job is a little bit harder to achieve, but that's what we're gonna be talking about today. Um, a permanent job doesn't necessarily mean um, 40 or 38 hours a week, which is full time. You can have a part time job, say 20 hours a week, and it's still considered permanent. We call it permanent because it's a um, it's a contract that gives you annual leave. So annual paid holidays, personal leave if you get sick, parental leave or family leave if there's a problem with your family. Uh, and there's also there's rules around notice of termination and redundancy pay. So it's more secure than a casual job. Uh, it is possible to get in Australia, and it's the type of job that you really should be seeking to increase your professional careers, but also your, um, but also your uh, stability in Australia. Many students with particular skills also take on freelance jobs. Um, this is great for people who have a skill like graphic design, video editing, web development, digital marketing. It's great for non-native English speakers, as it's often more about the content that you produce rather than the um, communication skills that you have. You can work for clients all around the world, whether it's in Australia or back home. You generally can charge your own rates, work your own hours, um, but your work may be irregular because you don't have a stable base of clients. So today we are going to talk about permanent jobs. And there's a few things that you will need if you're going to work in Australia. First thing is a tax file number so the government can register your tax. Uh, this is quite easy to get. Um, you register through the tax office and companies like Go Study Australia can help you do it uh, for free. Uh, if you want to work for yourself, you'll need an Australian business number. Um, and that's basically saying that you're running your own business. And then if you want to work in uh, various jobs, you might need certificates like a responsible gambling certificate. If you work in a bar, uh, responsible service of alcohol, if you again are serving alcohol. A working with children check if you are working in a job that involves children. A white card is if you are working in construction. Uh, first aid, a barista training if you want to make coffees. Some jobs may require you to do a criminal history check. These are all very, very easy to get. They're not difficult. Uh, and the jobs will generally tell you if you are required to have these. Um, and so you can, if you're successful in obtaining the job, you just go and register for these courses, take the course and get the certificate. So before you start with your job seeking guys, pay attention to the job description. Most companies will give you very specific instructions to apply. And if you don't follow them, you won't be considered. I advertise for a lot of jobs here in Australia. And many times I, I say, give me a cover letter explaining who you are and why you'd be suitable. And people just apply with an email and their resume. I completely ignore those emails because they have not followed the simple instructions. Read through the job descriptions and make sure your cover letter uh, actually addresses each of those job requirements. If you're doing a casual job, which will be your first point of call here in Australia, you generally apply for them face to face. Um, always ask to speak with the manager rather than the person who's behind the counter. Um, avoid peak hours when people are busy. So you want to go during uh, non-busy time so you can introduce yourself and have a good chat. Don't give up. You can always go back and reintroduce yourself after two or three days. Uh, dress appropriately. It's amazing how many people just turn up in shorts and a t-shirt uh, and expect to, to get a job. Uh, and make sure that your resume matches Australian standards. And I'll have some resources for you at the end of this um, talking about resumes. All right. So... What we're really going to talk about today is how to move from a casual job to a professional job. And you can use this information for your own career inside Argentina, or if you want to travel internationally and work overseas as well. 
LinkedIn is the most valuable resource that you will use uh, for professional jobs. It's used by over 500 million people. 96% of all recruiters use it. In Australia, nearly every business professional I know uses it. It can promote you as a person and as a professional far better than words on a resume. It also makes your resume searchable as it will rank you in Google. Uh, and it's where you promote yourself. LinkedIn is all about self-promotion and networking. And those who leverage it do very, very well. Uh, it's the place where people get to know who are you, what are your skills, and how do you present yourself. So we're going to talk about how do you set yourself up on LinkedIn. It's, uh, it's really important to think about LinkedIn is a journey and something that you should be setting up while you're at university because the people who are sitting next to you in your class are gonna be your colleagues, your employers, or your employees. Many university students that I talk to think that they won't want a LinkedIn account until they start a job. But those who start one at university are already miles ahead of everybody else because they've already started their professional network. So if you don't have a LinkedIn account, set one up today, and we're gonna talk about the best way to do that. The most important part of your LinkedIn profile is your photo. This is not Facebook. So you want professional shots. You don't want selfies. You don't want to be cute, funny, or sexy. You want to be professional. Uh, and you want to make it relate to your industry. So make it bright and clear and smile. This is a perfect example. Uh, this is one of my friends, Mariana. Uh, it's, a, it's a perfect LinkedIn photo. It shows professionalism. It shows she's a happy person. The lighting is fantastic. These are some of the bad photos. These are actual people on my LinkedIn, all right? So one is um, clearly at a nightclub. Another one is trying to promote himself as a musician, but uh, you can't see his face. Another one, the photo is squashed. And uh, if you look down on the, the bottom right, this guy is at a music festival drinking Brahma beer, which I think might be an Argentinian beer if I'm correct. Um, so very strange thing to have on your LinkedIn profile. Uh, so be very, very conscious of your photo and make sure it's professional. Aita. Think about how you look in the circle. So LinkedIn now presents your photo in a circle. Again, these are four other people in my own LinkedIn um, uh, network. One has no profile picture. One is far too close. This third person, he's an actual movie producer, yet... I can't really tell what, what's going on in that photo. And another one has his logo and it doesn't even look good in the circle. So this is the first thing people are going to look at at you on LinkedIn. You want it to look fantastic. Here's some examples of great photos. Um, it's my friend Paula. She runs a college here in Australia. Very professional. Mike in the middle. Uh, he, he's a little bit different looking, looking sideways, but again, it makes him stand out. And uh, this other guy here on the right, again, nice and professional. The next thing you want to think about is your profile. This is the text that you see at the bottom of the page. This should be a one sentence summary of who you are, what you stand for. So in my case, uh, I say 20 plus years of success in enabling, engaging and motivating the world's young people to make a difference to our world and their own lives. That's what I'm about. If you are involved in marketing, you could say marketing professional uh, with skills in search engine optimization and web development. If you are looking at HR, you could talk about human resources. Use this sentence as a uh, very first introduction as to who you are and what you are skilled at. There are some really important things to think about with this profile, and we'll talk about those shortly. Um, the description. All right, which is this profile, could also be long. This is um, a description from someone called uh, Javier, who was an intern for us in uh, from Spain. And he was a digital marketing intern. So rather than one sentence, he chose a very, very long introduction. But I've selected this as an excellent example because with this introduction, I know exactly what he's capable of. If you look at this uh, sentence um, in the second paragraph, areas that I'm specialized and tools used in my stack include SEO, PPC, 
data and analytics, funnel marketing, and CRO, which is conversion rate optimization. Now, as an employer, I know exactly what Javier's skills are without even needing to look at his work history. So this description and profile is extremely important. So don't leave it blank. Talk about yourself in the first person, which means my skills, I do this. Uh, many people list themselves in what's called the third person, which is where they would say something like, Simon is skilled in this and Simon does this. No, you want to talk about yourself as though this is me, this is what I do. You can include links to media like YouTube. Um, you can add your personality and check your spelling and grammar. Very, very important. Now, that point number six, if you look at check your spelling and grammar, I've purposely spelt grammar incorrectly. Uh, that's how Americans spell grammar. In Australia, we spell grammar with an E-R at the end. What I've done that for is to very specifically show you that if you are applying for a job in Australia, you need to be aware that some of the words that we spell are different to how America spells their words. And a small spelling mistake could cost you a job. So make sure that a native English speaker from the country that you are looking to apply in actually reviews your profile. Because one spelling mistake might mean that the person looking at your resume no longer looks at your resume. In LinkedIn, you have an opportunity to use a header image. And this is an image that you put in the background to signify what you're about. Uh, you can see here, Michael has listed uh, a small tree uh, supported by many people to indicate that he's about growth, networking, community, and co uh, collaboration. I think it's a beautiful image. Uh, other people, uh, like this guy here, Niall, show that they're a bit more into um, technology and different tools. He's got his own uh, branded background, which is really cool. And Polar here has Boss Your Future, which is the slogan of the college that she runs. So this is a very, very powerful tool. You can design your own backgrounds for free if you just Google LinkedIn background um, maker. There are lots of different tools online where you can select an image, write your text, and it will generate for you as an image. So it's um, yeah, very, very easy to do, but very, very important. All right, so once you've set up your photo, your background image, and your profile, it's now time to start talking about your experience. As a recruiter and as somebody who hires people, um, I am not so much worried about what your responsibilities were in a job. I want to know what you achieved. So tell me about what you achieved, not just what your responsibilities were. As an international person, I will not know what your company does in Argentina. So give me some context about your company. Include one or two sentences to tell me what your company is. Describe the difference that you made to a business. This is really important. This is about your achievements again, but it shows me that you can bring value to a business, not just do a job and use meaningful metrics. Percentages can be very vague. If you say that you increase sales by 100%, does that mean you took them from one sale to two sales a month? Or does that mean you took them from $100 million to $200 million in a month? Uh, it's very, very important that you clarify what those percentages are. So here's an example um, from my LinkedIn. And this is from my very first job uh, in America, actually. You can see I've broken up responsibilities and achievements. And under achievements, um, just three bullet points to show what we've done. I have not included a description of the company here because in the job that's listed above this was also with this company and I'd, I'd listed my description up there. So I, I've already done it once. I don't need to do it again. Here's an example of um, uh, some lines that we might see that are typical of a student who works at a restaurant, okay? Um, they might list themselves as their, this is how they list their responsibilities. I seated customers and waited on tables. I worked with others to make the sure the restaurant ran smoothly. That's their responsibilities. Tells me nothing about how good they are at their job or what they achieved. The same job could be presented differently. 
saying, I served an average of 35 customer tables per eight hour shift, ensuring all patrons received their meals promptly and solving problems immediately as they arose. I trained six new restaurant employees and participated actively in interviews with four candidates for waitstaff positions. And I was promoted to hostess or host after just three months on the job. It's the same job, but it's immediately telling me that you're number oriented, that you're detailed, you have the ability to train uh, other people. So believe me when I say LinkedIn is about how do you promote yourself? The way you choose to present the information is so critical and you really need to think, am I presenting myself as a professional? Because what's listed here is simply somebody who's working at a restaurant. But to me, it comes across a very professional approach to working at that restaurant. So once you've built your um, profile, your photo, you've listed your work history, it's time to start building your network. And this can start while you're at university. It does not have to wait until you get your first job. First way to do this is you can invite people to connect. LinkedIn is great at this. It will go through your email address. It'll send out invitations. But once you start meeting people, you might see people in your target industry that you want to connect with. For instance, I work in international education. So I might find somebody that works at a university that I want to connect with because perhaps I want to send them students to study at that university. So I can find them um, by searching for the university. I see people that, that work there and I click on invite, just like you do on Facebook or Instagram. But when you invite someone, you can leave them a message as to why you want to connect. These days, so many people just send a random invitation with no explanation and it brings no value to the person. They might not even accept you. So when you uh, leave your note as why you want to connect, Give them a small compliment or um, appeal to their sense of ego. Something like, hi, Simon, I read your article on the value of marketing. I'd love your thoughts. I'd like to um, continue uh, staying in contact. All right, so it acknowledges that you've read, that, read something that they've done, you liked it, and you'd like to contribute. So that's one way to build your network. The second is to join groups in LinkedIn um, and meet people in your target industry. So let's say you're an engineer and you want to come to Australia and work as an engineer. It's going to be really, really hard for you just to get a job um, applying from Argentina randomly through um, various job sites in Australia. But if you go on LinkedIn and start joining engineers associations, engineer groups, um, special uh, discussion groups and start making connections, you've already got a network of people and you can start asking them questions about What's their working environment like? What skills are valued? So just like there's Facebook groups, search for LinkedIn groups and join them. Number three is share articles and tag other people. LinkedIn amplifies your message so much more than Facebook or Instagram. So if you have an article or a piece of news and you share it, then you can tag some friends. And what will happen is those friends get notified and their friends then get notified that that their friend has been notified in a tag. And it's a good way for people to recognize you because you're starting to tag other professionals and saying, hey, this is something you might be interested in. Another thing you can do is look at a contact and ask them for a connection. So again, let's go back to the example of um, me looking for a contact at the University of Queensland. I'm, I, might, uh, I might find a a connection that works at the University of Queensland, but I don't know them directly. But LinkedIn will say, you have three friends who are connected to this person. So then I could go to my friend and say, I see you're connected to this person at University of Queensland. Would you mind giving me an introduction? This is what LinkedIn is for, guys. You do not need to be shy about networking. You do not need to be afraid of connecting with people. The platform is built for this. It's not like Facebook where it's just for your friends. It's not like Instagram where you follow people passively. This is about connecting, sharing, and promoting yourself as a professional and looking for opportunities to help each other. So be active. LinkedIn will promote you if you contribute and promote. All right. So here's an example um, of somebody reaching out to me. This is somebody from Brazil. And they read an article I wrote. And this guy I'd never met before, he said, I just read your article on the value of customers and the value of marketing. Brilliant. I'm Paula Mills's friend and would be a pleasure to connect with you. 
So what this guy has done here is, number one, he's acknowledged that he read my article. Number two, he said that he liked it. And number three, he said that he is a friend of one of my connections. Of course, I'm going to accept this guy as one of my connections. And we still keep in touch today. And this was three years ago. This other guy uh, contacted me and said, Hi, Simon, Charles McKay here. I'm expanding my network of professionals with a view to educate on inbound marketing and sales pipeline strategies. As such, I'd welcome the opportunity to connect with you on LinkedIn. Really, really good message. He's told me that he's interested in education, digital marketing, and pipeline strategies. That's something that I'm also interested in. So, yes, I connected with him. All right, so we talked about groups. Let's say that you want to work in marketing um, and you need to find people to start building your network. Just go and search. So if, you're, if your goal is to work in marketing in Sydney, go on LinkedIn. I typed in Marketing Sydney. I found it, the first uh, page that came up was called Australia Digital Marketing Professionals, Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane, Perth, Adelaide, and Canberra. It has 1,700 members. So instantly, you have found 1,700 people who are working in Australia that are going to be looking for um, people to work with them in the future. They're going to be looking for help and assistance. They'll be looking for contractors. They'll be looking for education. If you join that group, you're instantly going to start making connections. And if you're in Argentina, but starting to plan your trip to Australia, wouldn't it be advisable that you already have some connections so when you arrive, you can say, hey, I'm, in, I'm here now. I've already interacted with these people. Does anybody have an opportunity that I can take up? Uh, if you look at chef jobs or hospitality, for people who are even looking for casual work, um, this group has 62,000 members. And this is people who work in hospitality. Of course, they're gonna be looking for staff and posting job opportunities. Too many students think that they need to go through the same old um, channels to get a job. And that's just waiting for a job to be posted on a job board. Now, go on LinkedIn, guys. Start building your network. Guarantee it. If you are proactive, you will start finding opportunities. And they might not give you a job while you're overseas, but you'll have the connections here when you arrive to make sure that you can move into one of these roles. So a couple of key principles when reaching out to people uh, and building your profile. Keep it professional. This is not a chance to talk about political views, uh, what you did on the weekend. This is about your field of expertise and how you can network and help others. Add media if it's possible. If you have videos or images, it's great to add those so people can really um, experience what you've done. Don't be afraid to ask for recommendations. So just like uh, when you apply for a job, you can give a referee to, of that company to call and say, hey, was this person a good employee? LinkedIn will put that reference for you. So anybody looking at your profile will see it. And you can ask your contacts to give you a reference. So on the right hand side here, one of my old staff said, hi there, I'm writing to ask if you could give me a brief recommendation of my work that I can include on my LinkedIn profile. So then it gives me a link, I write her a, a, um, a reference and that's on her LinkedIn profile forever. What that does now is Cindy has used my association and my credibility to leverage her own credibility. So in Australia, I'm reasonably well known as an education professional by universities uh, and colleges in Australia. Cindy now has a reference from me and she's looking for a job in education. People know that she's associated with me and that I endorse her. They'll be far more likely to give her a job. Make sure that you have at least two references on your LinkedIn before you start applying for work. It's very, very important. All right, how to build your brand. You can include video in your profile. Uh, you might wanna make a video presentation of yourself and integrate this in via PowerPoint or, or link via YouTube. These days, people wanna know who you are and what you're capable of. And a 30 second or a one minute video is a great way to stand out from the crowd. If you've got visual representations of work that you've done, add that to your profile as well. LinkedIn uses a tool called SlideShare, which is like PowerPoint, where you can add PDFs and PowerPoints to your profile. And most importantly, share your interests constantly. LinkedIn rewards those who are active on, um, on posting and contributing. 
So if you find articles or news that you like, post about that. Comment on other people's articles and sh and give commentary about whether you agree, you disagree, or if you have an opinion. There are too many people on LinkedIn that just go uh, like or I agree or great article, but they don't express why they like it or they don't express an alternative view. And by not doing that, you're missing a big opportunity to present yourself in public. So here is my biggest tips for building a brand. Number one, write your own content. You might find an article that you really like um, about in the field of interest that you're looking to get a job in. Rather than just sharing it, why not take some of those concepts and write your own article and express your own view? It shows people that you have a brain and that you can contribute. Next, you can comment on other people's posts. Really, really important because this is how you network. It shows that you're listening and that you're engaged. Reshare other people's articles, but when you reshare it, don't just share without a comment, share with an opinion. Number four, guys, never position yourself as a student. I understand you're all at university now, but as a, uh, as a recruiter, I do not want to hire a student, I want to hire a professional. If you're studying, that's fine, that's great. We're all studying something at some point in our lives. But if you position yourself as a student, you may as well say that you have no experience. Here's uh, an example of somebody who, um, uh, who uh, has listed themselves as social media marketing uh, student currently working as a marketing coordinator. Why not actually list yourself as a marketing coordinator instead of a student? It's a, it's a really simple change to your profile, but it makes a massive difference. Uh, you need to display your skills and interests and you need to show that you're really effective at what you're doing. And I'll give you an example. If you're going for a marketing role and um, there's two candidates and one candidate has been um, inactive on LinkedIn and I know nothing about them, but the other candidate has been posting articles and, and, and commenting on search engine optimization, metrics and branding, who do you think I'm gonna be more interested in? It's gonna be the person who's actually, um, uh, who's actually showcased an interest in diversity in, in their opinions on marketing. And here's a personal example, guys. Um, a couple of years ago, I wrote an article about how I believe colleges are wasting marketing money by distributing brochures to agencies such as myself without actually asking for, um, for, for our opinion of if we want them. And I wrote an article where I um, explained how much money they are wasting uh, the article explained that how not only is it environmentally damaging, but that money could be better used in other parts of their marketing budget. Within uh, a, a day or so, it had nearly 700 views, nearly 100 people liked it, 16 people commented, and 13 people reshared it. Now we're a couple of years on, and those stats are much bigger. But what happened was... Um, several very important people saw this article. You can see here, 26 of those people were CEOs and directors of very high profile um, institutions. The outcome of this was pretty huge. I had a bunch of uh, very um, uh, engaged industry people start contacting me and, and commenting saying that they agreed and could they even share this article with other people. They also said that that it made them think about their own marketing strategy. So number one, that positions me in a position of authority. Uh, and number two, it, it gives me credibility because other important people start commenting on my article. The very next day, somebody messaged me and said, Simon, you are great. You just got yourself a job, if you like, of course. I'm keen to pay 15% more than your current salary plus commissions and bonuses. I would love to headhunt you. Now. That's an amazing compliment. And just from one single article where I showed an opinion and I gave some feedback, somebody said, I like what this guy uh, has to offer and I like the way he thinks, I'd like to offer him a job. Now, it was a very strange way to approach someone for a job and I wasn't looking for another job, so I uh, politely declined. But this is actually how you get yourselves job, guys. You need to show that you are more active, more engaged, and more knowledgeable than anyone else. Once you've actually started posting on LinkedIn um, and, and looked at jobs, LinkedIn will actually send you 
uh, job notifications, similar to what you're currently doing or to jobs that you're interested in. So that's another really good resource too. All right, so let's sort of start focusing now about you as an international student looking at um, moving to a, somewhere like Australia and how um, some of the challenges that you'll have. Here's a key concern. Most Australian employers will assume that your written English will be poor. Because you're from another country uh, where Spanish is the main language, you have an, an immediate perception disadvantage. So you will need to uh, ensure that you do everything to um, make sure your writing is absolutely perfect. And to do that, I highly recommend that you have somebody who is a native Australian English speaker review your resume and your, C and your LinkedIn profile. You can do this if you don't know anyone from Australia, you can do this via a service called uh, Upwork or freelancer.com or even fiverr.com. For $5, it'll, it'll be life-changing for you. You need to rewrite your profile in English. You might have your profile written in Spanish um, for obviously your, your professions in Spain, but you would need to rewrite it in English so whoever is looking at your profile can understand it. I don't suggest that you start two LinkedIn profiles, one for Argentina, one for Australia, because you're dividing your network. Uh, number three, this is really important, particularly in Australia. Use your bilingual capability as an asset. I mentioned before, there's a natural assumption that your English will be poor. But in Australia, we only speak one language, and that's English. And I am so impressed by uh, people from other country who can speak two languages, even if one is not as uh, strong as the other. In Europe, some people speak five languages. And to me, that is an asset. So when you're positioning yourself, let's just, I use the, the word marketing a lot because I, 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 I like marketing, right? If you're gonna position yourself as a marketer, why not position yourself as a bilingual marketer? All of a sudden, you've now given me uh, an indication that you are better than someone in Australia who's just a marketer because you speak two languages. So if uh, turn your, um, your non-native English speaking into an asset and position yourself as a bilingual professional or a trilingual professional if you speak three languages, don't assume that we know what your previous organization is or does. Uh, so you're gonna need to showcase that. And you're going to need to try and showcase that you've had some Australian experience or you understand the Australian um, business environment. One of the best ways to do this is to do some consulting on a project, which could be as simple as helping out a friend. Um, and you can list that as a job project. Uh, I do the same with interns. When I get an intern from um, overseas that wants to work in Australia and they come and work for my company, I make sure that they don't list it on their profile as an internship because it doesn't matter that it wasn't paid. It was a, an engagement project where they were actually working for my company, representing my company. So I allow them and encourage them to call it a contract. All right. So if you're an intern, lose the word intern from your profile, call it a, a short term contract. It doesn't matter if it wasn't paid or it wasn't a full employment position but it positions you as a professional and not a student. That's what I want you guys to really understand is really important. All right, so let's talk about searching for jobs. There are other ways you can search for jobs. LinkedIn has a feature called Open Candidates. This actually lets recruiters know that you are open and looking for work. Um, even if you're not looking for a job in Australia and you wanna use this in Argentina, it's fantastic. So you just need to go to your settings and uh, click the button that says, let recruiters know you're open and it will give uh, anyone that uses the recruiting feature uh, of LinkedIn um, a positioning on you that says that you are actually looking for work, which is great. Uh, as we said, you can actually use um, not only to, uh, you can use the search to not only find groups, but you can find jobs. So if you type in marketing um, and I put Sydney, Australia, you can see here that's um, 1700 jobs in sales, 1,100 jobs in marketing and 933 in business development came up. So there are lots and lots and lots of professional jobs that are promoted on LinkedIn. 
And the great thing is you can see who promoted them. You can learn about the company. And this is where I'm really going to give you advanced LinkedIn strategies. So we're going to start talking about applying for jobs. So if you are applying for a job, always follow the instructions. Include a cover letter if possible, even, um, uh, even if it's not specifically directed. A cover, cover letter is your chance to position yourself uh, and frame who you are and what you do. As we said, um, writing skills uh, is going to be a challenge for, for many people from overseas because naturally their written English is not as good and maybe is in their spoken English. So you might want to search for jobs that are less reliant on writing, creative jobs where you're doing design or development, sales jobs where it's more about speaking, retail jobs or data entry is less reliant on grammar skills. Uh, and I'm very serious with number four, a well-presented video can shoot you to the top of the list. When I'm hiring for a job, I normally finish my, um, my job ad with um, submit a resume and cover letter to this address or send me a one minute video telling me who you are and why you'd be good. And I will always watch every video because I can learn more from a video than I can from a resume. Check your spelling. Um, as I said before, there are various ways to spell things between uh, Australia and America, and you're probably more familiar with American spelling. Uh, I deal with a lot of French people, and I once rejected an application as they spelt connection as connection. Uh, if you can't spell right in your application, why would I believe you can do it in a paid job? All right, so this is advanced LinkedIn strategy here, and this is something that most people don't think to do. If you're applying for a job, research the company, look at uh, their website, look at the LinkedIn um, profiles, look at how many people are actually working at that company from LinkedIn. Look at how many people are engaged. Is the CEO active and promoting himself on Facebook? What does, what does that um, CEO stand for? Uh, address each of the points in the job ad requirements. And number three is really important. Research the job advertiser. In most cases, a job on LinkedIn is posted by a person rather than a recruitment agency. And so you can actually learn about the person who is posting what they, um, how long they've been at the company, what their job is, what they believe in, what they're interested in. And you can use this during your interview because you now know about this person and how to engage with them. Send a follow-up message. So I actually got my job uh, at Go Study um, with the wider company through LinkedIn. And when I applied, I then messaged the person who advertised and said, um, uh, the lady was Dawn, I said, hi Dawn, I've just applied for the role on, um, through Red Hill. I'd be very interested in staying in contact with you to keep track of all, all the news and engagements with the company. So the fact that I sent a follow-up message meant she already had my name on her brain when she was looking at various applications. Very, very smart. You've got to be proactive and present yourself as a, as a professional here. Um, I've also hired people that I previously overlooked because they followed up with me and made, made them reconsider. So I mentioned uh, before this webinar started that the, the person who actually helped me design this presentation was from Argentina. She's my graphic designer. I originally rejected her application because I had somebody else in mind. And she actually messaged me and said, hi, Simon, I haven't heard from you yet about my application. I'd really encourage you to look at it again um, for a couple of different reasons. So I went back, reviewed her application. Sure enough, I had missed a few key considerations and she ended up getting the job. So guys, this is the value of LinkedIn. You can speak directly to the hiring person um, and, and be proactive here. Uh, you can also ask to connect with that person, but present value. Um, for instance, if you've written an article, you might be like, uh, hi, Simon, um, I've applied for this job. I also thought you might be interested in my opinions on this topic. Here are some articles that I've written. Again, you're giving yourself an advantage over people who just submit a resume. Now, if you land a job in Australia, uh, an interview, there's a few things that you should do. And this is whether you're in Australia or if you're in Argentina. Number one, research the people who are interviewing you. If it's a panel of people or a single person, you can use LinkedIn to research their professional background. You can learn if they're a formal or an informal person. You can see from my LinkedIn that the way I dress, the way I talk, I'm very informal. Therefore, if I'm interviewing people, I want people to have an informal engagement with me. 
um, and they can find out my interests and we can have a natural conversation. So in LinkedIn, uh, so in an interview, you'll often be asked questions such as, do you have any questions? And if you're trying to build rapport with somebody, one of the first things that you want to do is ask about them. Many people will just ask a boring question like, how long have you worked here? Trying to start conversation. But if you have researched on LinkedIn, you will know that already. And it shows that you're proactive. So you can turn that question, how long have you worked here, into, hey, I've noticed you've worked here for six years in various roles. Which department have you enjoyed working in the most? Do you see the difference there? You've now positioned yourself as, uh, I guess, a naive candidate to somebody who is empowered with information and willing to have a professional conversation at a professional level. And that is what is going to get you a job, even if you're not from the country that you're interviewing in. All right. If you're coming to Australia, guys, a couple of tips on how we like to do interviews in Australia. We are quite informal, even with um, professional jobs. We don't have to refer to people as sir or madam. We can refer to people as first name. Uh, but you are going to be competing with people who have English as their first uh, language. So how are you going to address this? I've said to you uh, previously that you need to um, get your own writing correct. But as an employer, my brain will also be thinking, you don't speak English naturally, I'm going to need to have somebody correct your work. So if you get asked, how, um, how about, how is your language abilities? How will you go? You want to make sure that you can cover the requirements of the role. Of the role. So you're more than welcome to say that, um, yes, I acknowledge it, English isn't my first language, but uh, I am very proficient, but I use uh, other tools such as Grammarly, self-editing, and I'm also prepared to ask colleagues if wording is the most natural way to say something. Notice this last one. I haven't said I'm going to ask colleagues to proof my work. As an employer, I don't want to pay you to do half a job and then have a colleague finish that job for you in a professional way. But what you've done in this third one is you've acknowledged that you are professional, but you, you, you know that in Australia, there might be a different way to word something. And so you can ask a colleague if that's the most natural way to word a sentence. You're not acknowledging that you don't know how to spell or use grammar. Don't present your language skills as an issue. If you're concerned about it, they will be too. So just dismiss it. If somebody, if somebody says to you, oh, how are you going to go with writing in English? Just say, I'm fine. I can do this at a professional level. And I have uh, various strategies and techniques to self-edit and use Grammarly. And I'm happy to take advice on whether it's something is the most natural way to word something. As an employer, if I heard that, I would be very, very confident. Make your interview conversational. Aussies are generally very informal. I want to have a chat. I want to enjoy who I'm working with. I don't want to be um, very much in a hierarchical power struggle that you get with a lot of Asian cultures where it's very much the boss at the top, the employees at the bottom, and there's no mixing in between. Australia is not like that. We really like to interact all on the same level. Don't say that you're wanting a job so you can learn and grow. That presents no value to me. I know that you'll learn and grow in a job, but I want to know what you're going to bring to the job. Many students um, treat a job as a charity act, and they say, I want this job so I can learn and grow myself. But they're not telling the employer what value they'll bring to the employer. So just um, basically acknowledge that you want to join this job because you want to be part of something bigger. You want to use your skills in a new environment um, that you know that you can make a difference to a particular project. Bring value to me, not act as a charity case. Um, some employers won't know about your visa and working rights. So make sure that you know exactly everything you need to know so you can explain the position. Some professional um, companies might not know that a student visa holder can only work 20 hours a week. Uh, and so you need to actually showcase this information and how you can make that fit within the requirements of the job. Now, many people coming to Australia might take a job that is below their skill level. I've seen people who are executive staff of companies in, in Latin America come and take uh, an entry level marketing job here in Sydney. And uh, when I say, well, won't you get bored? Aren't you too high powered for this job? Which is a concern of employers. 
um, you need to show that that's not an issue because you need your first start in a new country. So use it as an advantage. Show that you're an expert and that this job will be easy, but don't get the impression that you'll get bored and leave. Show that you're excited to apply your high level knowledge to a new international environment. If you've done a job for many, many years and you're going to do the same job in Australia, then say this job actually will be quite easy for me, but I'm going to really enjoy the challenge of bringing that into a new cultural environment. It's great. And then say, hey, I actually can help you improve your processes and improve your strategy based on my own experience. So now uh, you're positioning this yourself as somebody who can help the company, not who's going to use the company. And that's really important. All right. After your interview, guys, send a follow up message thanking the interviewer within three hours of the meeting. Don't wait till the next day. Don't do it one hour after. It shows you're too keen. Three hours is perfect. Something really, really simple. Hi, Simon. I really enjoyed the meeting today. But again, bring value. I wanted to send you this follow up article that I wrote on LinkedIn showcasing my uh, opinions on marketing. I look forward to hearing from you about the role uh, whenever you're ready. It shows me, number one, that you uh, are respectful of my time because you said thank you for meeting with me. It shows me that there's more value that you can demonstrate because you've got an article and an opinion that might not have been appropriate to bring up in an interview, but I can take my time to read. And uh, within three hours, it shows me that you're diligent. If you do it the next day, it's kind of like I'm a second thought. So do it on the spot. You provide additional references if needed, and it's okay to provide references from your home country. Just provide a way that I can contact that person other than phone, so probably email. In the interview, if you've got examples of your work, come and, um, and bring sales figures, marketing brochures, whatever you have done, come and show me what your specific contributions were. were. And if you can find a similar Australian companies, reference those to link your experience in, in your Argentinian company. For instance, if you worked at a cafe in Argentina and it's got a particular way of operating and it's similar to a cafe here in Australia, then say, I worked at this place, it's similar to this company in Australia. And that shows me that you understand how Australian companies operate and that you know that there are some differences and you can recognize those differences. All right. Ask questions, but good questions. I'm not going to go through what those questions are, um, but... You, as an, as an employee, I want to know that you can think and I want to hear you challenge me on the role and why uh, we would be a good employer for you. Um, make sure that you can handle the barriers so you can only work 20 hours a week. Uh, respond with, I can achieve more in 20 hours than most people can in 30, or I'd be happy to prove my worth at 20 hours a week and then discuss more permanent opportunities, which is that sponsorship that I talked about. And it is very common for businesses to sponsor people for full-time work from a student visa. If you're overqualified for the role, given that most of you are students, that might not be an, an issue right now. But again, we talked about things something like, I'm excited to bring my extensive skills and experience into a new working environment. All right. Uh, sorry, we're going backwards here. All right, guys, uh, English is essential. Um, make sure that you improve your English as much as possible uh, and that you show that um, you can communicate at a professional level. So if you need to take an English course, do so. Come over to Australia, sign up for an English course. Um, there are courses over here called English for Business, which are a fantastic way to take your, uh, your conversational English into a professional level. Uh, and Go Study can help you find those English for Business courses if that's something you're interested in. I know we're in lockdown right now, so it might be the perfect chance to actually study online. Um, and so if you want to do an English course online while you're in lockdown, perfect. But start improving your professional English so you, you move above conversational English. Uh, we have a free ebook if you would like to um, download it. It's called The Ultimate Guide to Getting a Job in Australia. You can download it from our Spanish site. So go study os .es, uh, forward slash Australia, forward slash ebooks, uh, e forward slash trabajo. Uh, and that will go through a lot of what we've talked about today. And it'll have examples of resumes, places to find work. You might find that quite helpful. Uh, and we might even send this link out to everybody who attended afterwards in case you'd like to download it. 
if you'd like some help coming to Australia, please do contact us. You can go to gostudyaus.es. That's our Spanish site. Uh, and we can help you uh, select courses. Uh, when you get here, we run job help seminars. We can give you all the skills you need to find a job and connect you to people. But it's really going to be up to you guys, right? LinkedIn is the best place to start. Um, it's exciting journey. Don't wait till you've graduated. Start now. Start with the, those in the classroom. Start with your teachers. Uh, and good luck on your journey, guys. I hope you in, uh, enjoy it. And I hope to see you out in Australia at some point in the future. Oh, great. Thanks great. Thank you, Simon. This was a very interesting presentation with a lot of, uh, you know, very interesting information. And I want to open uh, the floor to students. So let's see if they have any questions, any doubts, uh, if there's anything else that they would like to know. Yep. You can either, you know, like open your mics and speak or you can write on the chat and I will read your, your message. Okay. Everybody's saying thank you. Okay. Awesome. Okay. Uh, let's see. We have here um, Rocco. You have a question. Yes. Go ahead. Yes. Thank you. Hi. How are you? Hi, Rocco. Um, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Thanks. I have a question. Well, because I'm 18 years old and yep. I don't have uh, too much uh, professional work experience as other people. So yes. what do you recommend me to make my profile to be more uh, completed, to say, in some way? Yeah, good, good, good question. Um, projects. Start looking at ways that you can get involved in different projects yeah. that position yourself as a professional. For instance, if uh, you might have a friend that is um, has a company or working at a company, Go and ask them, can I get involved somehow? Take on a small project uh, for a couple of weeks and then there's a professional experience. It was a short-term contract to assist in office administration or a short-term contract to help build a website. That will, that will help. It's also okay not to have professional, professional experience. If you work at a bar or if you work at a cafe, you can list that. And as you get older and as you graduate, that just moves down on your list of jobs, but it shows that you've got to start somewhere, right? And no one is expecting an 18 year old to have professional experience, but um, it's quite important that you get involved in other things. So another thing that you could do is start something yourself. If you go on a, like an online course like Udemy, uh, where for $10 you can learn how to create a new website or build a business, and just try doing something yourself. Start an e-commerce store, build your own website, uh, and then you can list that as owner and founder of www.website.com. So you can position yourself as a professional even if you don't necessarily have the experience. Okay. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you. So we have another question. Let's see. Morena. Hey, Simon. How are you? Very nice. Very good. Thank you. I've been thinking about doing a post-graduate course in Australia. But I'm doing a which? The living costs with doing a part-time job. Could I? Yeah. Could I? Yeah, everything if I have a part-time job while studying. Okay, it, um, you're a little bit um, distorted, but I think you're asking about living costs in Australia with a part-time job, is that right? Yeah. Yep, okay. It's it's challenging. Um, it's, it's very challenging. And I suggest that you have money to cover your expenses for uh, the first six to 12 months while you're over here. So the reality, guys, is Australia uh, is an expensive place to live, but um, you can base, do a basic budget. So 20 hours a week of working, imagine you'll get paid somewhere between $25 to $30 an hour. So that's going to give you somewhere between um, uh, $500 to $600 a week. Your tuition would be costing about maybe $150 a week for vocational courses. It'll cost about $300 a week for university courses and about $250 a week for English courses. Your living costs 
um, your your room, if you're in a shared house, will be about two hundred dollars a week. So that doesn't leave a lot of money for food, travel, beer, party, and the rest of enjoying Australia. Um, so it's very important that you have some funds to come over here to support yourself as well as studying. Uh, and when you get a, and that's why it's also great to try and get a professional job that pays more than a casual job. So I'm not going to pretend that it's easy uh, because of that 20 hour limitation is quite challenging. That's why a lot of Argentinians prefer to come over on a working holiday visa first, work for a, as much as they can, build up a lot of savings, then move on to a student visa, which has those work rights restrictions. There is, um, uh, there are some ways that people can create more money, and that's by working as a freelancer, where you're not necessarily um, limited by hours of work because you're charging per project. So the smart students can actually are the ones with those creative or design skills, and they can approach a company and say, I'll work as a freelancer. Um, so we're not going to record how many hours I'm working, but I am going to be billing you per project. And that's a really smart way to get around it. Mm -hmm. Great. Thanks, Simon. Okay, so we have one more question. So let's see here. Uh, Luana asks, if I go to Australia with a one-year-long visa, working holiday visa, would that make it harder for me to get a highly qualified job? Yeah, good, good question. So one of the problems with working holiday is that you can only stay with an employer for six months and then you have to change. So many professional employers are a little bit hesitant to hire somebody knowing that they'll leave in only six months time. And that is a challenge, but there are many jobs that are short term contract jobs and they're a great way to get experience. Um, if you go through something like a recruiter where you would be placed in a short term contract, that's also a good way to actually present your skills. So many companies are open to sponsoring you. So if you say, okay, I will work for six months. If you like what I do, you can then sponsor me and then I can work for you for two years with unlimited work rights. We generally um, see more people m using the student visa option because that has, you can get a student visa for one year, five years, however long your courses are gonna be, and that adds more stability for your employer. But they have a trade-off, 20 hours a week, versus unlimited hours. And it is one of the challenges of an international, but if you find a company that is open to sponsorship and if you've got the skills, then it's something that you can get around. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much. And no worries. One more question, the last question uh, from Tomas. Do you recommend LinkedIn Premium to find jobs faster? Uh, Yes, but I don't think you need to at this level uh, because LinkedIn Premium is for, ex I'd say it's for extreme high professionals. Um, for, for people starting out, follow the tips that I gave you. It's free. It takes time. It's also fun. Um, and it's a little bit addictive. Actually, you know, when people start engaging with your content and, and you get recognized for being um, somebody with an opinion that people respect, it's a really good feeling. And, and so I would just start with that. If you uh, get really serious when you're out here, you can try LinkedIn Premium, but I don't think you need it at this stage. Just follow those tips, get your profile and your network working, and then you'll start seeing how quickly things move for you. Okay, great. And Rodrigo Martin, the last question. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you in advance, Simon, uh, for yep. the, the invaluable information you just gave us. Um, Great. But I have this question regarding the, the visas, because, yes. I mean, I've entered to the Australian uh, embassy here in Argentina in order yep. to apply for a visa. But they, I mean, once you are like trying to apply, at the end, uh, it appears this legend that says that... Um, I mean, your the the barriers are closed, and you're not like <laughs> yeah. So so that, absolutely. Um, I'll I'll just give everybody an overview of the Australian situation right now. Um, our borders are closed, and will likely still be closed for up to 12 months for people looking to come into Australia, which is a long time. 
Um, and as somebody that works with international students, we haven't had any come into Australia for 15 months and having no more coming in for 12 months will be challenging. There will be some exceptions. Uh, so in a couple of months, there will be some students who will be allowed to come in if they're studying um, at universities in New South Wales. Uh, and they're working on the programs right now to actually bring them, uh, get the approvals in place. It's very unlikely that working holiday makers, tourists, and even English students will be allowed in until at least July next year. So um, when you say you went to the embassy and you couldn't get a visa, then yeah, they haven't been granting visas for some time. Um, but the good news is you can you can apply for a student visa and if you um, cannot enter the country because of COVID and your visa is pushed back or you need to um, uh, get a new visa, the government will give you a, a, that cost for free. So once you've done it once, you're kind of protected until you actually end up here in Australia. So many people are getting um, their applications together, paying for that visa because they know that, all right, even if it was supposed to start in three months time, I can push it back and it won't cost me anything. Um, when the borders do open, preference will be given to international students who already have an active visa. So, uh, and when borders open, everybody will start applying for a visa. So I encourage you, if you are interested to enroll in a course, get your student visa, and then you'll be ready and waiting and you'll be ahead of anyone that doesn't have a visa already. Um, that being said, we're still looking at six to 12 months before any students can come in. So it's, um, it's all in the hands of the government right now. All right. Okay, thanks. well, thank you very much. Well, you know, uh, this is the, the way it is, right? We have, we're yeah. really very you just got to work with it. Right, so yeah. that's why, but anyway, we have to thank, right, the pandemic, because like due to this type of, uh, you know, situation we're living, we have Simon here with us today online, <laughs> right? So we, we are taking advantage of the situation. We're all at home, and but we're all getting you know, very useful information that we can use once the borders are open and we get back to normal, okay? Yeah, absolutely. Thank yeah, thank you. Everybody. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Enjoy Bye. your evening. We have here a lot of very nice comments. Everybody thanking you for this opportunity. And well, Simon, thank you very much once again. Thank you, the Embassy of no Australia. I, inv I invite anyone as well to find me on LinkedIn, Simon Costain. Um, find me on LinkedIn, follow me, and you can see what I post, how I interact, and you can use that as an example for what you'd like to do as well. Great. Okay, so we'll keep in touch. Bye bye, All everybody. Right. Thank you very much. See you later. Bye, thank bye. you. Thank you. Bye. bye. Bye-bye, good day. Bye, guys. Bye, thank you.